Hello, and welcome to part two of what could be up to seven parts of the town class long patrol. Now I'm saying up to seven because I'm still debating over the last couple, so we'll leave that to one side. And part two is all about their construction in peacetime. Why they were being constructed, why they were called the town class cruisers, where they came from, where they were going. <laughs> Start off, let's talk about their name. Why are they called Town Class Cruisers? Why were they not the Minotaur class as they were originally going to be? Hence, the diagram here is labeled M Class Cruisers. Well, originally, they start off with two Arafusa class cruisers, are renamed and redesignated on the stocks. So they have a lot of history with the Arafusas. They're two sides of the same coin. One is built for one part of the world and one sort of operations, and the other is built for the other side. In that, one is your offensive long-range trade interdictor, which can also do trade defense. And the other one is your slightly shorter range, slightly smaller trade defender, which can also do trade interdiction. Why not call them the Minotaur class, though? The RN has a nice history of the Minotaurs. There was a 74 gun, uh, third rate ship of the line, which fought at both the Nile and Trafalgar. You know, there's another Minotaur which served in with some distinction in the 18 in the 1800s. Another one, which is the lead class, uh, became the lead class of an ironclad class of battleships. Another one in 1906 had been the lead of an art class of armoured cruisers. And eventually, HMS Minotaur would, of course, well, the town class of HMS Minotaur would become HMS Newcastle. And HMS Minotaur, the later one of the Minotaur class light cruisers, would become HMCS Ontario. So why does Minotaur keep losing out to names of places? Well, It's not the names of places. Think of it as names of constituencies. Now, the reason the RN gets slightly worried when it's talking about its town class cruisers is because it is building ships which are, by their very <laughs> definition, by their size, their armament, everything, they are obviously able to do and for the trade addiction mission. These are large ships. They're almost as big as a county class heavy cruiser. They're powerful. They're imposing. They're going to be used for powerful and imposing. But the RN, it has a problem. It needs to be subtle. It can't afford to start. It doesn't want to start a great race or a cruiser race. It can't afford it at the moment. The government's not opening up the purse strings yet. Remember, the government, British government, doesn't open the purse strings up till late in the 1930s. So the RN is trying to balance these things. It doesn't want a race. It doesn't want to look like it's provoking a race. But it needs to be prepared for a race. How do you get a ship you are going to publicly declare, well, at least have senior members of your force publicly declare they don't want, but still get it. Now, this is, of course, all hypothesis on my part. This is all, none of this is written down. None of this would ever have been written down. But considering some of the maneuvers they play, did in other areas, the fact that this class changes from being the Minotaur class, the previous class of cruisers had been Amphion, Arafusa, Leander.
At the same time, as eventually they will come with the tribal class and then the crown colonies. It's politics. It's pure and simple politics. It's a class which isn't going to be cut. How much going to cut HMS Newcastle? Who wants to lose, uh, lose the Newcastle seats? Glasgow? Good lord, are you insane? <sighs> Why is the county class cruiser which has the most extensive refit HMS London? Because of hullware. <sighs> so. This is the ship. They have their name changed to ensure that they will not be cancelled. And the RN will get enough of them. What you can see is very carefully the armor box that is in the hull. Where the armor is along the outside as a sort of form of belt. And there is a bit of a belt around the ship. But it isn't necessarily inclusive and sometimes the belt goes inside the ship. Creating armored boxes inside the structure. So you have the outer hull acting as in some ways like a capping, the capping plate. Especially on six inch or maybe eight inch fire, where all the core stuff with which if it gets damaged, cause you problems, is armored inside. This makes them very, very strong ships. Four triple guns. Twelve. First batch of crown colonies and the planned but never built Neptunes would equal that. There'll even be another ship I'll be talking about in a second which would have had 16. But 12 6 inch guns is there for a reason. It's a tremendous amount of firepower. A truly astonishing amount of firepower. When combined with four double four inch or six double four inch guns for air, for air defense and 40 millimeters they have a very large loadout and that original ideas were to have two aircraft stored in hangars one aircraft stored on the catapult as is shown in that plan and two more boxed aboard there are variations on that included. But the idea was that these, air, these ships would have significant organic air capability. In simple terms, they would be excellent for wide area search. Now, this doesn't just mean for trade interdiction, because the thing was, it was actually considered for another duty as well. And I'm not talking about scouting for the fleet. I'm still talking about independent cruiser operations. Trade protection. Because if you have a convoy, and you can have those aircraft flying off from the convoy to give you a notice warning where enemy surface raiders might be, can they orientate your cruisers in a position so if the enemy can't do come for the convoy, they have to go through the cruisers. But also, you can route the convoy to avoid the surface raiders. Or keep as much distance between you as possible. So the RN had an answer and legitimate reason for every single system. 12 6-inch guns. Why do you have 12 6-inch guns? Weight of fire. We'll get into that. Everyone, of course, going, 8-inch <clears throat> has far more firepower against other ships, so this must be against commerce. Well, most cruisers are not that well armoured. And the engagement range that they reckon there's going to be is 18 kilometers. So bear that in mind. Um, that's the end button.
So let's consider the stats of the class. As constructed, there are three batches. Southamptons, Gloucesters, and Edinburghs. Southamptons are the smallest, coming in at 9,100 tons standard, 11,350 tons full. Gloucesters, 9,400 tons standard, and 11,650 tons full. Just realized I missed out the zero off the tons there. And then the Edinburghs, 10,550 tons standard, 13,175 tons full. I.e., by the time the Edinburghs are ordered, not only is no one taking any notice of the treaties, the Royal Navy is now walking straight over them. Completely. So Edinburgh is HMS Belfast and HMS Edinburgh. Southamptons include HMS Birmingham, who has a very different hull who has a very different bow construction, which affects the hull design and our operation further on, but we'll talk about that later. And Gloucesters are some very special ships as well. Length also changes. Starts off at 591 foot, 6 inches. Gloucesters, the same. Edinburgh's are 613 feet, 6 inches. Now, I'm not sure about you, but an extra 22 feet. That's quite a lot of space they're giving in. Now, my old maths is that it is three and a third feet to a meter. Or rather, three foot four inches to a meter. And I know that's not quite right because it is 2.54, but just go with me here. So, that is an extra. Well, according to the maths here, 6.7 meters. That is space. That is hull shaping. That is getting the most out of your ship. But if you're thinking about it, if you're just adding an extra 6.7 meters onto your length and an extra 51 centimeters onto your beam. Where is all that extra weight going? Because that is a lot of weight. The Southamptons and Gloucesters, the Gloucesters jumped 300 tons. The Edinburghs, they've jumped 1,150 tons. 1,150 tons. And there'll be some other ships I'll be talking about which would have jumped a further 1,150 tons. Now, they all have four Admiralty free drum boilers, and this might make uh, not seem sensible, but despite having a very similar speed, uh, shaft horsepower, they all achieve roughly the same speed. Again, this comes down to the hull shaping. If you have a longer, thinner hull, proportionally to the length, you'll often be far more aerodynamic and smoother going through the water, so you get a higher speed. But you also tend to be more rocky, so you become a slightly more difficult gun platform. This explains the Arleigh Burke class design and their hull shaping versus the Daring class hull shaping and why one's gone one way and one's gone the other way. Because it depends on what you're prioritizing. Your ship as a weapons platform or your ship as a high-speed unit. But what is really interesting is the sheer amount of fuel oil they carry, 2,000 tons, 2,100 tons, 2,260 tons. 
And the hull shaping really does show in terms of the cruising speed because for Edinburgh's, it's 8,000 nautical miles at 14 knots. For Gloucester's, it's 7,850 nautical miles at 13 knots. For Southampton's, it's 7,700 nautical miles at 13 knots. Amazing what you can achieve. The Edinburgh's have more armor. But they have the same amount of guns. Broadly speaking, they have six four-inch guns. Well, six double four-inch guns, so 12 of them. And a few more uh, two-pounder pom-poms and, uh, you know, a few more machine guns. They will all grow dramatically during wartime. And as you can see, they're listed as carrying free carry aircraft carried with one waist catapult. <clears throat> now, there is a reason for this as well. It's decided eventually that the boxed aircraft don't help. They take too much effort and energy. It's better to carry spare parts to keep your free aircraft going. Basically, enough spare parts you can rebuild an aircraft. Or two. <clears throat> so technically, they still carry. Uh, if you were looking at those stores, you probably would say you have enough stores to carry, to build two more aircraft. But technically, they carry only three aircraft. Also, as you can see, Gloucesters have a higher number of crewmen than Edinburgh's or Southampton's. And again, there's a reason for this. Gloucesters have machinery which is trying to get the most out of it in the same space as the Southamptons, broadly speaking, which means to because of the difficulty of fitting into spots, it takes longer to do the maintenance, so you need more personnel per watch. So if you think about it, it's 100 personnel. Divide by... Roughly six takes it down quite a bit. With the Edinburgh's, because they have more space, and that's saying something when you consider going around HMS Belfast, they managed to make do with a mere, well, a mere 33 more personnel. So, earlier I mentioned firepower, and this is what I'm talking about. This is what the RN were really thinking about. They had done a lot of time studying World War I experiences. They had done a lot of time studying interwar exercises. And they came up with the idea that most engagement ranges for cruisers would be at about 15 kilometers. So they decided they were going to test them at roughly 18 kilometers range. And that was going to be the criteria, what they could do to reach out to 18 kilometers. Now, I've got a tribal class destroyer pictured on here. That's actually its range out to 15 kilometers because their range was maximum 16 kilometers. But I wanted them included because I wanted a base mark from a, 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 the most powerful destroyer. And this is the tonnage of shells which will be impacting the enemy. Okay, this is the amount of ton uh, this is the amount of tonnage of shells fired. So if you consider that it's your percentage of shells which are going to hit, and that actually the six-inch shell is lighter than the eight-inch shell, the fact is that the six-inch cruisers are really going to outperform the eight-inch cruisers, and this was the whole reason for the RN going with the treble six-inch guns for the, ta uh, for the town class. The actual results, and I have these in front of me, were that the estimated number of targets, a uh, number of shells to reach their targets in 10 minutes would be 392 within 10 minutes from a county class. But a town class, a tribal class destroyer, or a first batch crown colony 
could all achieve 936 shells on their target within 10 minutes. So, if you're running at an idea that you might score, let's say, 1 in 20 of your shells will hit the enemy. 936 shells fired means that you ha you are probably going to hit your enemy 46 times. Maybe 47. A county class firing a mere 392. Well, yes, those shells are individually more powerful, and that's a full county I'm talking about with eight guns, not six. But it will probably possibly only hit the enemy as much as 18 times. Possibly 19 if it's lucky in that same time on that same metric. And why are they expecting to do such have such poor accuracy? Because they're expecting enemy to be maneuvering. They're expecting it to be a combat where both ships are maneuvering, where there's a storm going on, all these factors to filter in. So they are planning for a worst case scenario. Now, you will see on here there is a super town. And I will get back to that. But a super town, if you want to know it, would in theory have delivered somewhere in the region of 1,251, or 52, depending on your maths. Um, shells on target in 10 minutes. That's an interesting graph. That is every single cruiser class that I have talked about in the entire series put in a plot on this graph of what weight of fire they're going to bring to bear within 10 minutes. And here's the really critical thing. The RN expected any chasing engagement, any running engagement, any engagement a cruiser was in to likely be bursts of 10 minute firings. The Crown Colony is are literally sitting on top of the town. Literally, the Crown Colony Fijis and the town are the same band going up. The Dido don't do too bad. The Didos <coughs> are nowhere near that bad, but they, again, do not get that much tonnage out there. Despite them being called machine gun cruisers and various other things, they will only deliver 28.29 tons within 10 minutes. They try to. They do try. So why am I talking about the super towns here? Because I knew I would get some questions about them. Super towns are, of course, the quad-gunned town class, which originally HMS Edinburgh and HMS Belfast were going to be, but the quad guns weren't ready. There was also plans for the Neptune class to potentially have them, and for the Crown Colonies to potentially have them. They decided not. In wartime, they decided to focus on just churning out the treble, uh, the treble turrets. However, the lovely people at World of Warships, thanks to Drak asking on my behalf, 
have allowed me to use this graph to this lovely picture to illustrate it because we go back again of that. The whole reason the RN was obsessed with getting the quad six inch gun on place because of the humongous amount of shells it could fire because of the simple fact that it would be 63.81 tons within 10 minutes of high explosive and okay six inch is not as penetrative as an 8 inch. That I have to be honest about. I, I, I will not claim it isn't. But there are a lot of things which are exposed on a modern warship, even in a modern warship in the 1920s and 30s. There are, especially going in World War II, there is radar, there are the direction finding systems. There are all the parts which don't have armor on. And then you've got the other issue. If you're getting hit enough times, and enough shells are pouring out towards you. What is that chance, that percentage chance of a critical hit by fluke happening? You say something is a one in a thousand chance that that shell will cause critical damage. If I'm firing 1,250 or more shells, you've got a problem. It's, it would have been a tremendously powerful weapon. It would have been a tremendously capable weapon. So, why not go there? As I said, war stops that. War means it cannot... Britain cannot afford to keep on pushing. And there's only... But... If it hadn't been for the pressures of war, and remember this, the Crown Colonies are ordered before war begins. So the Crown Colony is in many cases a continuation of the earlier towns, rather than of Edinburgh subclass. Crown Colonies are far more a continuation of the Southamptons even more than the Gloucesters. But... There is certainly a high probability, in my mind, that if peace had continued somehow tenuously for more years, let's say till 1942, I have no doubt that a quadruple six-inch gun cruiser would have been in service with the RN because of their obsession with these stats. And nowhere have I found this graph produced by the Royal Navy. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is a graph the Royal Navy produced. But it's a recurring theme which comes back in every cruiser design. They're talking about these figures. So I don't think they put together a graph of this. Like, I, they might have done, but I haven't found it anywhere. So I'm going to presume they didn't. But the fact is this mattered to them. And it makes sense, because this is all being done pre-radar. But even when you have radar fire control, that sheer amount of firepower you can get down. Now, let's say you have radar fire control. That's a lot of firepower you can get down with range. And yes, 8-inch can fly further. That's true. But will it fly far enough to counterbalance this? The whole point of the RN's town class cruisers was not necessarily that they were going to supplant 8 inch cruisers as the heavy cruisers in the world. It was that they were logistically, qualitatively, and functionally the better fit for what the RN wanted them to do. This is my other point when I start hearing people talk about the 9.2-inch cruiser. 
there is an option. If the RN is looking at a cruiser to fill in for the cattle ships, which is now getting rid of the battleships, which are going, a 9.2-inch cruiser does make sense. But if they're still looking at a cruiser for a cruiser's role, and I know what they actually produce, i.e. the Tiger class, but what they wanted to produce, Neptunes, etc., they are heading in this direction. And I can't say they were wrong, because that looks good to me. Now, beam-wise, and why am I spending so much time discussing this? When I'm talking about town class, why am I spending so much time discussing a super town? Because my thinking is the best way to discuss the concepts which drive the town class design is to look at the concepts of how they would drive the super town design. It would have to be Beamia to look uh, to uh, to support those quad turrets. They are going to be wider. Odds are, difference would be about the same again as the Edinburgh's to the Gloucesters, in that you would probably have another foot or so added on. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but there is a reason for this. Because you're going to add a foot wider, and because you'll probably keep the engines the same, you'll probably have to grow again by another 6.7 meters. Maybe even a full 7 meters, or a 7.01 meters to make my life easy, so I can say that it would have been 194 meters long. Okay? Or 635 feet. Now that's a large cruiser. That is a powerful cruiser. But again, if you've managed to creep the crew requirements, broadly speaking, the same, it'll probably be about 850. Again, you've got a fourth gun in each turret, but not everything scales up. With the extra length, with the extra little beam, you actually don't need to make it that much wider to accommodate things. Your main thing you're going to have to be worrying about accommodating is your extra 800 odd shells. Or if you're being sensible, which we can always hope, we can always hope you're being sensible. Your extra 1600 shells. Because hopefully you've gone to 250 shells per gun rather than 200 per gun. Again, that's going to push up the weight. And <laughs> we'd probably be talking about another 1,150 tons. But all these things would come in quite fab. The real question is, though, why didn't the RN go straight into this? After the Crown, after the HMS Edinburgh and HMS Belfast, why didn't they push ahead, go right? And we've had to build two ships as triples, large ships. We've checked them out. Uh, these were designed to be roughly capable of taking a quad turret, um, but they've only had, they've, we've slotted for a triple, uh, we've sort of slotted the treble turrets in because it, it's a quad turret wasn't ready. Why haven't we pushed forward? And I honestly don't have a good answer. I would argue probably it's cost. Probably it is a need to ramp up production and ramp up speed of production. And also to balance complexity. The iron at this time is pushing for a quad turret King George V, a battle turret ship. It's got aircraft carriers under production. It's got do destroyers coming in which are high-end 
I can imagine them sitting there thinking the quad tart would offer us an exceptional advantage. But does the treble turret offer us enough? And I think the answer was, for the moment, yes. So that is why the RN tends to focus in on the treble six inch turret. Because have a look at where the counties come on that. The county class cruiser, this light little light, light blue line, is third. They would have either had to massively increase the gun cycle time. Now, what do I mean by gun cycle time? Well, I'm not sure train things. If you're talking about a gun cycle time, increase the rate of fire, you decrease the gun cycle time. So I should have said decrease the gun cycle time. My apologies. The gun cycle time, the average gun cycle time is what we're talking about. The average for a six inch gun is seven and a half seconds. Now, there are Ships which uh, which manage to achieve faster, and there are ships which don't. Most 6-inch and 5.25-inch guns have an average cycle time, that is from firing to firing again, of 7.5 seconds. Most gun crews, that's what they average across a 10-minute engagement. So, please... Anyone who wants to write and go, I know one who wrote who achieved this high speed of fire. Yes, they probably did. But across 10 minutes exercises, it came out, and this is the study I'm going off the Royal Navy's 1930s cruiser study, which produces the town class cruisers along with the Arafusa class and the tribal class destroyers. It's seven and a half seconds. And it holds for most of World War II. There's a post World War II study as well. The average for the 8-inch guns was 12 seconds. The average for the 4.7-inch guns on the tribal class destroyers is 5 seconds. So, for a 6-inch gun, it averages about 8 rounds a minute. That's the same for roughly a 5.25-inch gun. Especially depends on its angle of fire, because again, actually the 5.25 is firing level and straight can actually achieve a, a rate of fire of one every six seconds. But once they're at their sort of weird, crazy angles and they're doing all that sort of firing to hit targets up in the air and doing the diet, what they're supposed to do is dido, it goes down because it's more complicated and more difficult to maneuver. Again, with the town class cruisers, because of the space they have in their turrets, vis-a-vis -vis compared to the double gun turrets of the Leanders, Arafusas, and Amphians, actually they can achieve a slightly higher rate of fire in sometimes, sometimes lowers every six seconds themselves, but often orientating around seven seconds. But we still we go with the average to work this out. For a metric, when you're procuring a ship, you have to go with the averages. Maybes and couldas and hopefullys don't matter. What matters is what you can rely on. And what you can rely on are these rates of fire. And this amount of tonnage of, a high, of shells hitting your opponent at 18 kilometers, in the case of cruisers. Twenty-one second flight time. That's the other thing. It's one of those interesting things. When I started looking at the eight-inch guns and the six-inch guns, and I started looking at the range being eighteen kilometers, and for the destroyers, the range is outside fifteen kilometers, but that's nineteen seconds. Interesting one is that these Dido's have a flight time of 23 seconds, but we'll leave that to one side. Yeah. 
you have to in, you cannot overstate the difficulty of doing this with visual rangefinders and visual systems as they are planning on doing especially pre radar even when you've got radar it's still difficult to judge where your enemy's going to be in 21 seconds so whoever can get the most explosive and within the proximity of the target has the most chance of causing damage. Whoever can get the most number of shells within the target and uh, proximity of the target can co potentially cause far more damage. This is why the RN is looking at the six inch gun. And it's backed up by World War II experience. If we look at the various battles which happen Cape Spartavento, Cape Bon, Battle of the River Plate. Battle Assert, Rounds 1 and 2. <coughs> and various other little ship actions. Rate of fire, volume of fire matters. So. Why is this here? Because nothing illustrates the reason why the town class worked better than the super town which wasn't built. Even if it is called Plymouth. I would love it to have been called Plymouth, but I, I, I doubt they would have been called Plymouth. I think it would have been the Bristol class. And I have a sneaking suspicion as to why. Because if there had been a third of the Edinburghs, it was going to potentially be called Bristol. So I reckon it would have been the Bristol class. But that's me. I hope you've enjoyed part two. Part three will be the peacetime service prior to World War II. And then after that, we will get into individual class histories. Hope you enjoyed, and thank you very much for watching. And if you do like, please like, subscribe, maybe check out Discord and Patreon. And as it is that time of year, Merry Christmas. See you in a bit.